Um, Colleen is Vice President and Senior Consultant at Keystone Partners. Colleen provides career management advice to executives, managers, and other professionals from a wide range of industries. Colleen's a former litigator and leads the Keystone Partners Legal Practice Group. Prior to joining Keystone, Colleen was Director of Legal Recruiting and Senior Manager of Professional Development at Chilhel and Stewart, and before that, a career counselor at the BU Law School. Colleen's a frequent pre presenter at events sponsored by MCLE, Harvard Law School, MIT Sloan Alumni Association, and the Association of Legal Administrators. She's also published articles in a variety of legal publications. So take it away, Colleen. Thank you, Sharon. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me join you. Uh, I know just based on the names that I can see on the, the membership list for people who registered, um, we've got some friends on the call. You know who you are from various chapters of what my, my bio is, uh, according to what Sharon shared with everyone. So it's a pleasure to be uh, presenting um, LinkedIn for in-house counsel. If I could just move my chat and get to the screen. Okay, so LinkedIn for in-house lawyers, leveraging connections for professional growth. Uh, let me open up by saying, um, so LinkedIn is constantly changing. Um, I can attest that even since our call, my call with Julie Duffy and with Sharon in planning, LinkedIn has changed in significant ways. Um, and you, if you're a, a user frequently, then you might have seen these changes as well. But I have, uh, even within the last two hours, updated some screenshots because LinkedIn experiments and changes and in fact for the first time in a long time had a pretty significant user interface update um, so you are seeing the the screenshots here that will um, give you the the most recent and current up-to-date look we are going to be all in screenshots here in slides uh, I don't know about you in your homes but the the competition for bandwidth uh, always makes it safer to have screenshots but certainly the uh, the the walkthrough for some of the concepts that we'll go through and the view and the vision of what you're going to see it will help you get used to how LinkedIn works and will allow you uh, I think to roll with it when LinkedIn has its its changes so it's certainly the best game in town for what it is um, but we we just need to go with it as they as they make their evolutions and, and reformatting okay so Let's look at our agenda. So we're going to put LinkedIn in context um, for, for all of the uses we might uh, be looking at in our own chapters. I wanna make it clear, obviously, uh, if you heard part of my work is working with people who are in a, in a job search uh, transition mode. Uh, this tool is super helpful for everyone. I know a lot of people think of it as a job search tool, but when we look to put it in context in just a moment, remember that this tool this platform in linkedin is a great support and resource for every chapter that you're trying to build next whether it's continuing to work switching roles adding something new to your personal life with volunteering board service so all of the things that we're looking at from retirement and just staying connected with people to actual job search which is what a lot of people think of it for or even business development it is all of those things and much more so so we'll put linkedin in context for the professional usage we will talk through also how to build a standout profile. Some of the themes that we'll look at in this quick hour, there's been a lot of action packed into this hour, but a lot of the results that you see and the experiences that you have on LinkedIn are based on what is in your profile, but it doesn't stop there. So starting with what you create and what you put into your profile to make it as robust as possible, we're going to have ripple effects that cascade through other parts. So we'll talk about building the standout profile first. Even if you already have one, some of these points are going to be very helpful in reminding, uh, reminding us all the best practices for the, the personal profile that we put out there about ourselves. Then activity that we conduct on LinkedIn. What, what does it mean to have high value activity? Activity that's going to have an actual more of an impact than we might think to amplify the reach that you have on the on the uh, platform. Career change and other transitions I mentioned before. This is a this is a tool that is going to support you no matter what your goal is. Um, the career change again is a frequent use that people think of LinkedIn if they don't already for their work, but other transition that's going to support us in preparation and execution of those plans as well. So we'll talk about networking, which is something that uh, I, I know for, for some it's a, not the most uh, enjoyable concept of networking, but really it's a matter of creating relationships 
um, putting content out there for people so that you can create even, especially in an environment like this, a virtual connection, even though you're not sitting in the same room or, or speaking um, for, for any period of time. LinkedIn jobs, we'll, we'll talk about the jobs tab. It's going to be um, one of the, the lighter touch moments for a, a sub bullet here, but still it's very important that people understand what the jobs tab is and what it is not. So we'll talk a bit more about that. Using LinkedIn for professional development and learning. And then finally, questions and answer. There'll be plenty of time for that. All of the question and answer you're going to put in the chat. So putting LinkedIn in context. Just to, just to let you know, again, you're going to get all of these slides. Some of these slides are highly visual. It's more a matter of, since we're not logged into the platform itself, I wanted to make sure that you know where you should train your eye when you go looking for either a feature or a button on your own page. So uh, we'll start off with some level setting. Um, and why does LinkedIn matter? Some of these are specifically targeted quotes for people in the legal industry. So the world's largest professional network and digital business card of the 21st century. Uh, it's a go-to social media. And by the way, it is social media. I think sometimes it's unfortunate that it is part of that cluster or family within social media uh, because it is such a professional platform that sometimes people uh, have a hard time thinking of it as social media. Uh, but it's a go-to social media for business. Forbes research tells us that the most individuals will go to LinkedIn before going to your own firm or company website to learn more about the organization. Um, it's this next ad week comment talks about how it's, it's uh, you know, a clean conversation, much more professional. 94% of recruiters, for those of you who are, who are in the job search, 94% of recruiters use LinkedIn to screen job candidates and hot off the presses, a quote from this morning, uh, an article that Forbes put out and it was all about personal branding. Happy to share the link if you want to see the whole thing, but it is a great reminder that people are researching you whether you like it or not. Uh, and then this LinkedIn platform and what you put on it, what, how you interact with it, that lets you define what they're going to find in that research. So it's really important that you engage with your profile at least. And we would even recommend going beyond just engaging with your profile and making connections. So here's another screenshot that I thought was interesting. This is a 2000, uh, 2018 infographic that uh, content marketing green target that's a company that does content marketing strategy and the zoikhauser group which i know has worked with firms in boston for sure uh, but this just gives you a snapshot for where do people go to do research when you're thinking about how important it is you for the resource for figuring out where you might want to put your legal spend dollars on the outside of the firm um, so this is just a, a nice infographic, looks, looks far to the right here, or second to the right LinkedIn profile, and at least 40% uh, say it's somewhat important, certainly the very important doesn't shy away with 10%, and then neutral, it might be a matter of people looking and, and maybe not finding it, but if you are in the market to hire external counsel, this is uh, certainly a, a reminder of all of the important areas to look at. Now, building a standout profile, um, whether you have a profile or not, and frequently I'll, I'll meet with people who are at all levels of their career that are just dipping their toe in LinkedIn. So an overview of what it takes to have as robust a profile as LinkedIn will allow or you know, define it as in its own terms, quote unquote, an all-star profile. So if your profile has the following things in this bulleted list, uh, it, it is giving you a compliment by labeling it all-star. And it is actually treating you differently on the backside of things. So all throughout what we're going to talk about LinkedIn activity, whether it's what you populate your profile with or what you do with your profile and your, your external outreach and activity, everything has an impact on what, what LinkedIn does to treat you better or frankly worse sometimes depending on the algorithm. So you must have a profile photo. You need to identify your location. So, um, you can identify it broadly with Greater Boston. I know that's what I have as opposed to the, the zip code for my town identifies my town. I'd much rather be clustered in the city. Um, the industry that you're in, you would pick from a drop down which industry you are most, you most identify with. Your current or most recent position. Now this is, uh, there should, uh, in our all, all of our minds a question mark. I mentioned before LinkedIn sometimes experiments or, or shifts. Um, LinkedIn hasn't told us this, but based on people who make it their life's work to experiment on LinkedIn from the outside, um, that there are different experiences. Sometimes I've worked with clients when we will put an end date on their most recent role. So their 
uh, unemployed right now and looking for a new role, once they put an end date on their most recent employer, their most recent role, frequently LinkedIn will knock them down off of All Star and take them down to, I want to say it's expert. Still others, though, will put an end date on an, uh, an organization role and they maintain the All Star status. So I don't know how to explain it. Uh, we're still kind of crowdsourcing people's experiences, but there's a chance that your All Star status could be taken away if you don't have something that's listed as to present. Let's see. So five plus skills. The skills are the section towards the end of your profile, towards the bottom, uh, skills and endorsements. So skills appear on your page as almost like a brick with either a word or phrases in it that you can define. Um, LinkedIn will suggest skills if you, if you don't want to uh, kick it off with typing it in. You have complete control over what goes in your skills section. One thing to note though, you see here it says five plus skills. So as soon as you have at least four skills, and of course you should have five plus if you want to be an all-star, but as soon as you have four or more skills, LinkedIn will allow you to identify three and only three skills that you say are your top three skills. It is very important that you don't just let LinkedIn decide what goes in those top three sections. Uh, because I've seen clients who have um, maybe made updates and, and been more thoughtful with the, the three key terms that they want to be known by. And as soon as they identify those and reorder so that there's a gold, silver, and bronze medal in the top three for skills, the things that LinkedIn presents them are much more relevant. Their search, turning up in searches, they say, they feel like they're becoming much more relevant or, or popular. Um, so you really want to tend tend to that skills section and make sure that you identify which three deserve that top three spot. Education, so you need to provide educational material or, or evidence of which uh, schools you might have attended and where your degrees are from. You don't have to include dates if you don't want to. Um, and then finally, having connections, which means being officially connected in Facebook words, it would be friends, but this would be connections of 50 or more. We'll say a bit more about connections in a few slides, um, but the quality of your connections, of course, is going to be the most important thing. All right. So if we look at establishing a brand, how do you establish a brand? A lot of people think, well, you know, I I've heard of this concept of having a personal brand, but what does that mean? If we think through what lots of us might see in the profile sections uh, and, and the headlines that people have in their profiles. Frequently, if you look at a list of results of people, it's title at company, title at company. And frequently there's a lot lost and left on the table for what that might mean. Uh, so we really want to identify how can we present ourselves in the profile from the very top of it, starting with whether we put a degree or a certification in our name. Uh, the, the, the concepts that we put out there for someone that not only show up when you look at someone's profile, so it'll be visible if you check out my profile, you'll see all of the content, but certain parts of your profile actually travel with any activity that you do, whether you like something, you comment on something, you share on something. If we look over to the right here, Gemma's headline is below, Experience General Counsel with extensive in-house experience across multiple industries. That headline is traveling with both her picture and her name and is stamped wherever she interacts with LinkedIn. We'll see that in a few slides here. So from the top down with your name, identify what your degrees or certifications are. Certainly not a requirement, but it is an opportunity for you to identify a brand. You wanna customize your URL. We'll see on the right side, Gemma's URL ends with the last letter of her last name. If you do not act to customize your URL, it will end with a series of random letters and numbers. And you want to come across as someone who, number one, knows how to use the tool, um, but, but also that who's, who's going in and um, making sure that people know that from start to finish, from URL to content, you know, and your, your professional approach to using this tool is going to be part of your brand as well. Your photo, you have two options. Here we have Gemma's headshot, which is very nice. We can make a visual eye contact here. And then behind it, Gemma has a, a, the, the standard LinkedIn banner in the back, but other people will have things that identify either where they, where they are. So maybe this, the skyline of Boston or uh, chemical compounds in the back, or uh, I know I have one former client who was in finance and healthcare, and she had graphics in the back that you didn't even have to have your glasses on to be able to understand, to read her headline. You could just look at the graphics in the back and understand where she was in sector. 
The profile picture, I would say, is an absolute must. Uh, certainly LinkedIn reports that many, many more clicks on your profile will happen if you have a profile. Uh, a profile photo, but even without the data from, from LinkedIn, it's, it's a missed opportunity. Really want to make a professional and personal connection with the person that's looking at your profile. And then finally, the headline. So the headline is what you see on the right under Gemma's name. You have 220 characters. You can include spaces there. And there are lots of approaches. As I mentioned before, some people leave the default of title at company, but that's potentially a huge missed opportunity to, uh, to give people a bit more information. For instance, associate at law firm. I don't even know what your specialty is, you know, what group you might be in. So think about that. When you're going in-house, we'll talk a bit more about some of the, the key terms that are, are potentially more relevant to you than others. But think about how you can use that valuable real estate of those 220 characters when you identify what is your headline. Okay, so this is a quick hit slide. This just compares the new and improved quote unquote warm look from LinkedIn as of, I wanna say the 24th, they rolled this out, the 24th of September. Um, but it's the, the banner style in the back. I've seen lots of various pastel colors, always the same graphics. And then this is the new no photo thumbnail. But compare that to the difference that this has. So this is Omar, he's one of my colleagues, um, and a nice background that makes it, it's almost like your own web page or advertisement. So you can, you can identify not only by having someone make visual eye contact, uh, but by providing a bit more information about you and or your employer. Certainly if, if, you're, if you're working for an employer and it's good for you, I know my background references Keystone Partners. I'm such a client facing and customer facing uh, employee that it's in my best interest to, to raise the, the, uh, the profile and uh, I use that banner as well. So here we're looking at keywords, standard keyword searches. This is the engine of how people find each other. If they're not typing you in by name, then you may be just ending up in someone's results page, depending on what is in your content. So the standard keywords that people search, whether you're looking at people who are trying to add someone to their board, they're trying to find someone who has a particular specialty to make an introduction. Um, the standard titles that people will look at generally start with job titles. Functional terms, so what, what do you do in your role that's unique to someone in the in-house legal department, uh, or industry terms, so thinking through the, uh, the types of specialties that you have, and those are usually the most concrete, most frequently nouns, but think about what it is about you that, that puts you out there. Your unique attributes, we really want people to get specific um, it's rather than just associate at law firm or a senior counsel at company, what are you expert in? What is your particular niche? If there is a specialty that you bring with you, is it a matter of a uh, public company? Think of all of those phrases. We have a couple of the uh, identified um, potential concrete skill keywords here that someone might be looking for. And um, one of the challenges with LinkedIn is that we really want to artfully repeat certain words that are important to the industry and to what you want to achieve. We need to repeat them throughout different sections of the profile. That's another marker of a robust profile is repetition without making it feel like it's a word giant word cram for each for each section. So think about what in particular is you. So here we have a celebrity sighting. Here's Sharon's uh, a section of Sharon's profile page. The featured section is its own field, own window uh, towards the top of, of, the, uh, of the profile. But this is the area in which you can add videos. So Sharon here has a, a video on YouTube and it's a link to when she was speaking with the ACCNE board members. Um, information about privacy and compliance advisory. And then we can go to the right and see more. So these things are static. So Sharon put them here and she can add more. Um, for anyone who created any sections within their summary section, the content that's here used to be embedded in your summary. So that's why if you have a featured section that you didn't add yourself, but the, the content looks familiar, it's very likely you had some kind of media, a graphic, a link that was in your about section or summary section. 
that LinkedIn automatically put into what is a featured section. And it just adds so much more tendrils out to different media uh, that will be helpful for you to create your brand. Now, this is a minor thing, but I think it could turn into a major thing. This, if for anyone who's noticed on the right side of your profile or someone else's profile when you view, there is a field of what appears to be random collection of people. So this is a bit like uh, this collection of people, so people also viewed, if I looked at Sharon's profile and my husband looked at Sharon's profile, and then I looked at my best friend's profile and my husband looked at his boss's profile, because we have common search, uh, I'm the searcher and I've looked at a couple of different people, suddenly maybe my best friend Emily will show up on Sharon's page as people also viewed. It's a little bit like the Amazon cart. When you put a book or a product in your cart and Amazon says, you know what, other people that have bought that, they also buy these things and maybe you'd be interested. Um, at the very least, this collection is um, it's just added static on your page. It's a distraction for some. In my book, uh, especially when we're thinking about people who want to be found for their specialty and maybe get into a conversation about a potential job uh, offer, uh, we really do not want to be presenting competition for ourselves on our own page for whatever reason, even if it's just human beings wondering, oh, what is, what is uh, that organization that person works with? If someone leaves your page because of something you're kind of hanging out there as a sh something shiny and they never come back to your page, that is a lost opportunity. So this is something that most people I don't think realize you can disable and go into your settings in the profile. Um, and it's, it's under the, uh, the site experience that you can just deactivate this. It's people also viewed and just turn it off. That would be a championship move. Uh, so here's optimization behind the scenes. And we mean this in both uh, the algorithm sense, so the search engine optimization, but also a human looking at your profile page. You want to think about how LinkedIn works. So when someone searches LinkedIn, uh, the, the concept of relevancy to the searcher has to be front of mind for us. When I look into LinkedIn and I search uh, a couple of keywords together, and then everyone in this call goes in and searches for the exact same phrase. Yes, we might have some overlap because again, I know I've seen some, some familiar names on the, on the attendee list, but it's guaranteed to be a completely unique set of search results for people because LinkedIn first looks through, when I hit search, it looks through my first degree connections and then my second degree connections and then my third and then group members that uh, are have membership in the same LinkedIn groups as I do. And it's going to do the same unique kind of first degree first, second degree, and then third degree and fellow group members for every one of us. That shows us, uh, I think, a good illustration of how the concept of relevancy to the searcher makes a difference. We're not all seeing the same results. It's through the lens of our first degree connections and then outward. So it's really interesting sometimes to take a look at your competition, search for what you think someone would search for to find you and see where you come up in terms of, you know, compare yourself to what they have listed as a headline. What kind of skills do they have? Maybe it will identify for you some skills that you have, but you haven't put out there. Um, you want to have a good sense of what the rest of your peer group looks like on, the, on, this, uh, on this portal. Notice who and what stands out in the results page. And that's everything from the photograph that you have to how you describe what you are. Um, it's, it's a very quick decision when people are going through, they're not going to go, just think about this, when you're on Google or any of the other search engines, how far into the results do you go before you decide you've had enough? That is a super important concept to think about. We wanna do as much as we can to be found if someone's looking for someone like us. Uh, the search algorithm, now this again is behind the scenes, it seems to favor, because LinkedIn won't be completely forthright, but people experiment enough to understand that, of course, the network size, which when you think about it, it makes sense. If I've got one contact who's a first degree connection and they have one contact and one contact beyond that, uh, it's a very quick rope before we run into a complete pool of someone that you know, the, the results are be will be people that we don't know and don't have warm intros to. Um, but keywords for sure, I mentioned, uh, you wanna have the right keywords as well. It, for instance, when I was back at, at Chode, I had a couple of different roles from professional development and hybrid. And, uh, I was in the recruiting, a couple of recruiting roles. And if I ever wanted to do recruiting again, 
I would have to identify talent acquisition to be found by the people looking for the function. Different name, totally the same, same flavor of what the requirements are, but there has been an evolution in what people are calling it. So know what you're, what you're you know, used to calling yourself and what other people are calling that um, so that you're maintaining your currency on the, the keywords. So completing all relevant sections, again, that's an opportunity to work the right words in as many times as possible in an appropriate way. Active use. If you go two months without logging into LinkedIn, you're going to have a very different experience on LinkedIn than you would if you were on there every day or every week or even every 10 days. Uh, and then finally, group memberships. LinkedIn, LinkedIn groups, which you may, you may belong to some, I know the ACC uh, overall has one and the Northeast chapter has one, but group membership, that is a way to flock to um, uh, people that have something unique in common that may never meet each other personally. So if you think about the national group for the ACC, think of the thousands of people that are in that group, you've never met them, but you have a tether to them according to LinkedIn's connections, not a true first degree connection, but a tether to them in a different way uh, because you share that group membership. Now, best practices for connections. I, I, I would certainly recommend that you personalize invitations, especially to people that you are maybe reaching out to after a, a while, maybe someone that you just met uh, in a virtual chat through a networking conversation last week and you wanted to remind them of who you are. It's just, it's a nice habit to get into. Um, I certainly have been known to not personalize invitations when I know someone very well, uh, but I think the best practice is personalizing invitations. It's especially important if now, I would recommend against reaching out to connect with someone that you're not uh, already familiar with or acquainted with, but if you are ever reaching out to someone whom you have not met, you would, must absolutely reach out and explain what prompted the, re the outreach. What do you have in common? Is it a recommendation from someone or are you looking to uh, create a relationship with someone who has a particular specialty and why? And then evaluate the mutual benefit. Again, going back to the concept of not uh, trying to avoid to the extent that, that is um, appropriate, trying to connect with people that you don't know, think about the mutual benefit for the, maybe the recruiter relationship. So becoming connected to a recruiter, even though you don't know them, will actually do you well because you'll come up in their searches when they're looking for talent in a just-in-time way. Um, the mutual benefit also, I like to think of my connections, my first degree connections as you know, somewhat of a, a, a favor Rolodex uh, that I would feel comfortable reaching out to them to ask a question or a favor. And I would be, I would welcome them, they're reaching out to me to ask me a question or, or a favor of an introduction. So think about what the two way conversation and relationship might be. So thinking broadly, I think it's a mistake a lot of people make that they only connect with people that do what they do at the level at which they do it. You want to connect with people based on a relationship and, and that level of trust. Uh, thinking about past coworkers, current coworkers, classmates, you can read these here, neighbors and community, um, friends, family. I'm one of six kids uh, and four of my siblings are on LinkedIn. I am connected to each one of them. And it is not because I need LinkedIn to tell me where Kevin or Maria or Philip or Sean work. It's because I need to know who do Philip, Sean, Maria, and Kevin know. You know, if I'm looking for something and it would never occur to me to ask my electrical engineer brother if he knows someone who does speech pathology, LinkedIn is going to be the answer very quickly when I'm looking and knowing that that first degree connection that I have um, is going to certainly do me a favor or our parents will hear about it. Um, it's just, it's a nice way to take advantage of the relationships that we have and memorializing them on LinkedIn is the most important thing. Thinking about that second degree layer of connections, that is really where the magic happens. If we treat all of our connections in a way that is consistent with this methodology or philosophy, all of your second degree connections are likely to be one warm introduction away. And then we periodically, if there are people that you know that uh, maybe you've not spoken with lately or you wouldn't feel comfortable reaching out to them and you're fine if they don't reach out to you, make that separate, that separation or connection, uh, disconnection. They are not going to receive a notice, no, no signs go out, um, but weeding periodically in order to make your first degree connection, a really meaningful set of contacts. 
Okay, so high value LinkedIn activity. Now we're gonna have a series of screenshots here again so that I can show you where in your profile you would go and what happens when you click certain buttons. That's a frequent mystery. This is my homepage. So I've uh, put a, a red oval around this field that says start a post. If you put your cursor in there, the box to the bottom right comes up. So create the create a post and I can identify who I want to see it. What do I want to talk about? I can put in, as you can see from just the graphics, I can put in video, I can put in an image, I can add a document to it. Um, you could drop in the URL for an article and in a couple of sections, I'll, a couple of slides, I'll show you that. Uh, but if you have a particular goal in mind with your post, celebrate an occasion, you can see from the slide, create a poll, find an expert. This will help you shape not only who will see this, as we can see in the next slide, I clicked on the who do we want to share it with, who will see your post. Anyone, anyone plus Twitter. By the way, I, I don't think that you must be on Twitter, depending on what you do and what you're interested in, who you'd like to follow and who you'd like to reach. That's how you make a personal decision as to whether it's LinkedIn plus Twitter. Um, connections only, so only those people that are first degree, you can send some particular message to. Group members, like I mentioned before, Maybe you're in the ACC group, maybe you're in the ACC Northeast group or other things. Advanced settings makes it look like there's a, a heck of a host of things that you might choose from. I clicked on it less than an hour ago and still the only, the only uh, option there is to turn on comments or turn them off. So it's nothing really mysterious, although it looks it. So you can identify how broadly or how narrowly you want your content to be seen. Now here's another high value activity. When we want to uh, put a content addition in there or an update, and if I want to say thank you, Howard, so my, 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 our sister company, Essex Partners, Howard's a wonderful colleague, thank you, Howard, for that wonderful presentation. If I just type in the words, thank you, Howard, that was wonderful, and post it, everyone that I'm connected to, Howard's one of them, as you can see, everyone that I'm connected to will see my comment. If I use a quote unquote mention, so an at symbol, and then I start to type a name, all of a sudden anyone with Howard in, in, their, in their profile name that I'm first degree connected to, LinkedIn will offer me a drop down, and it basically it's saying, which Howard do you mean? I click on Howard Seidel and then it inserts a, a tag in there that when I post this, everyone that I'm connected to will see what I'm saying and I have now, in an appropriate way, according to LinkedIn, I have forced my way into Howard Seidel's feed. So everyone Howard's connected to that I'm not, whether I am or I'm not, is going to see it. So we've just amplified, we've doubled that stream of who sees it. So for every mention, and you can also mention a company, that is going to amplify your message. One of the most important things that people ask if they're active on the update side is, well, how can I make sure that reaches as far as it goes? Inserting mentions is a great way to do that because it's adding other people's first degree connection streams to what you are writing. Now here, using a hashtag or a topic, linked in LinkedIn speak, what you see as a hashtag, as you see here on this, on this screen towards the bottom, hashtag careers, hashtag human resources, uh, it's, they also refer to them as topics. Um, formerly known as channels for anyone who's been on LinkedIn for a while. So now it's topic. So you're, you're basically attaching something that is kind of a magnet depending on what people are looking for. Um, and relatively recently, um, Andrew, Andy Foote, Andy Foote, F-O-O-T-E, um, and I'll identify him in a bit. He, so he's a very well-known person who talks about LinkedIn. He experiments on LinkedIn all the time, super high level. Um, he started a discussion about how the value of the hashtag in something that you post is another way to grab people like a magnet, like a tractor beam. So if people care about hashtag human resources, once you put a content uh, together, in this case, I grabbed a URL from a Harvard Business Review and put it in here, it automatically loaded the picture. I didn't have to do it. But then LinkedIn also suggested, maybe you'd like to add hashtag careers. Maybe you'd like to add hashtag human resources. I could add hashtag pink flamingos on wallpaper and it would turn into a hashtag. No one would follow it, but the, the theory now is that in order to have as broad reach as you can make it, in the old days, having three hashtags was recommended now having at least six hashtags for different parts of what the article is about and why people might care about it 
is what puts the content out there in the most amplified way. So using a hashtag or hashtag uh, topic. Okay, so career change and other transitions. Again, it's you know LinkedIn, for some people they think about LinkedIn as the tool that you use when you're looking for a job, um, but it is so much more than that and, and was actually started far beyond, you know, beyond in the calendar when it was actually a moneymaker for the recruiting process. It was all about making relationships happen, making business happen. Uh, it happened to have turned into a very helpful tool in recruiting, but it is not only limited to that, certainly. So LinkedIn is a networking tool. Um, it benefits you, it benefits your organization and your network. Even if you never plan to leave the role that you're in now, think about all of the content that once you have a little bit of bandwidth to look beyond what's on your must do for the day, what kind of new information can you bring in? New processes, new thinking, or you know, over in that industry, uh, they're doing this, and I'm wondering if that's something that's around the corner for us. Maybe we should think about it. All of those valuable benefits of networking, LinkedIn can help us facilitate. I mentioned before, we need to recognize the power of the second degree connection. It is an, uh, a, for now, untapped source of new information that you should have an easy introduction to from all of your first degrees. And then this is this concept is probably no surprise, but it bears repeating. LinkedIn enhances face-to-face, -face, excuse me, face-to-face -face networking. It is not a replacement. And by face-to-face, -face, of course, we're talking these days about Zoom calls and phone. Um, but it's an opportunity to be on someone's mind using LinkedIn and showing up in their home feed, assuming that they're looking at it, is a great way to stay visible to someone, even if you have not been in the same city as they've been. Never mind in the same room. Uh, it's a great way to say in someone's consciousness. And that is one of the powerful parts of networking. And we raise our awareness on LinkedIn through updates, publishing original content. You can write a short article. You can write a long article. You can make a comment and share it about an article that you've, you've looked at and think more people should read. And then contributing to conversations, adding your comments, putting meaty content out there. All of these things are important ways that you interact and, and tap on the shoulder all of the people in your first degree connection. So here's how we search. This is another slide that I took within the last 48 hours because it is acting differently all of a sudden. In the olden days, like last week, you would put the cursor in the search field. The, there are two different screenshots here. In the top, you could put your uh, cursor in the search field at the top left and up would pop filters that you could use to you know, really roll in and, and narrow down what you were going to search for. Now, put the cursor in, even if you click on the magnifying glass, I cleared all of my search history because I wanted to have a clean screenshot here, but these three options, LinkedIn suggested these to me. Try searching for, and so obviously it's getting on board with the what's trending, what might people care about, COVID, World Health Organization, and coronavirus impact are things that LinkedIn suggested I might want to search on as recently as today or yesterday. Um, but one more slide here. So what if you want to look for someone? You want to find someone. In, in this case, I was typing in Sharon because, of course, we wanted to uh, give a shout out to Sharon Kamowitz. So I typed Sharon in and then hit search. Now, it was only after I hit search and had some results, which I've not copied here. Uh, once the results page showed up, it allowed me to see some filters. So as you can see in the, the top screenshot, from left to right, people, jobs, events, more, um, all of the things that I could choose from. In the bottom part of this screen, you see if you click on more, which is the left on the left side, that red oval, you can identify even additional filters that apply exclusively to content, companies, schools, groups, content for those of us who don't know and i think a lot of people don't recognize what content is according to linkedin content is whatever shows up in your home feed so you might not know you can actually search what has come up in your home feed and what is going on in home feeds back and forth so content that people are putting out there that is experienced through the home feed on the far right you see all filters dot 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 <laughs> this if you click this again i'm going to go very quickly through the next few slides but i just wanted to show you the breadth of things that pops up when you click on all filters and you can get very specific looking for people so if i want to find a sharon i you know i met someone years ago her name was sharon i don't remember um, what her last name was but she worked at amazon and so you can go through and put all of these filters in here um, including uh, first name last name company school all those good things 
So another way to search for people, if someone like my colleague, for example, Mark Newell, who knows pretty much everyone, if Mark Newell says, hey, let me know how I can help either in my search or in, in finding someone to add to my nonprofit board or you name it, um, I'm connected to Mark, which we can see from the first, the, the first um, degree connection to the right of his name. Because this is listed in blue, there's 500 plus connections, I can actually walk through one by one Mark's connections um, or I can use a filter and surgically go through Mark's connections based on some of the keywords, the school, the location, for example. If we look at the right here, so contact info, because this is blue, again, you're going to see probably more than you might see otherwise. Here, this is just my advertisement for if you can get to someone's email address, use, your, use their email address to communicate. Lots of people may be on LinkedIn and even you, you see that they have an active email address that you could write to. They don't always recognize when someone's email, uh, message is coming to them through LinkedIn, even when it lands in, for example, mnewell at essexpartners.com uh, inbox, it may very well fade into the woodwork like every other thing that has a subject line that includes the phrase LinkedIn, even though it says message from Mark Newell via LinkedIn. So I would always recommend that you write to people with email rather than relying on LinkedIn as, um, as a tool for messaging. This is another section that maybe some people don't recognize exists. Well, I looked up the quote unquote company page or school page for BU School of Law. And if you look at on the far left, you look at the alumni, uh, the alumni tab of their search bar, you can parse through people who are identified on LinkedIn as using BU School of Law as an entry in their education section. And then you can sort through identifying where they live, where they work, what they studied, what they're good at, um, what they're skilled at. And you can really narrow things down. If I wanted to find someone in San Francisco who works for Wells Fargo, I could do that probably right in this section. And the section at the bottom, you'll see there are a couple of faces here. Uh, every filter you add further shifts the, the profiles that you'll see in the bottom. And we'll start with the people that your first degree connected with. So the fellow alumni, that's a, a pretty helpful set of ways to structure a search for someone for whatever reason, uh, to include people that you have something that's a high barrier to entry. Maybe in this neck of the woods, the high barrier to entry isn't that you couldn't find lots of people from BU School of Law. But what if you were looking for someone who went to um, Stanford Law in Boston? You might not know them yet, but having that, that uh, characteristic in common, that experience in common, usually is what makes someone respond when they see fellow, and I'm sorry, I don't remember what the Stanford um, you know, logo is or what, what their mascot is, that's what it is. Okay, so Boolean search. If ever there was a crowd that understands Boolean search, it's, it's all of the attorneys. You can use Boolean search in the search field for LinkedIn. Um, a couple of just caveats according to LinkedIn's own language. It does not like curly quotes. It only likes, you know, straight smart, um, not smart quotes, but straight quotes, which I, I'm really not, I don't really know why whatever we type in the box is going to end up in the right font. I think that they mean if you create it in a Word document and copy it and paste it in, you have to be mindful of what your quotes are. Um, yes, parentheses are helpful. If you use not and or or, you must use them in uppercase. You cannot use a, a negative symbol for not. You cannot use a plus for and. Uh, if you don't put in quotes, it assumes it's an and search. Um, and then finally, you do, cannot have variants. You cannot do um, history and do H-I-S-T-O-R and then have historic historical history. It doesn't happen. It has to be that, that kind of straight up search. So networking and the job search, this is always good. So big picture. LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn can be very helpful in trying to learn more about an organization, who's on the organization chart, who's in the team that you might be working with. Um, but it, it helps, it's a little bit more of a self-help opportunity for people too. So if I'm the hiring manager, so the person who has the authority to make that hire and I'm running the process, not the talent acquisition people, but the, you know, the label of hiring manager, meaning the person who gets to make the decision. Um, I can go into LinkedIn and, and do some self-help. I can find people in my own network rather than relying on anyone else to go there. You can also, if you're looking to add people to your team, you can go into LinkedIn. Who do you know? Who do you know that knows someone that looks like they'd have a great 
um, have a great background or set of experiences to add to that team. That is going to be a huge help in trying to sort through the hundreds of applications from strangers you might get on inbound uh, compared to, hey, someone I used to work with at the law firm is connected with that person, what do they think? Um, so certainly looking for a job on LinkedIn is a very popular activity for some, but it is not the only reason why people use it. The next bullet here, when we say surfacing roles, I mentioned that we're gonna talk about the jobs tab. One of the most important things to know about the jobs tab is that jobs don't end up there by accident. LinkedIn is not an aggregator. It's not going out and gathering things up in a net and adding it to its jobs tab. It costs lots of money to have a recruiter license uh, and recruiters will use LinkedIn to source talent and they've got lots of fancy filters and more filters than you or I would have as regular people. Um, but uh, an average a, a average user, so a non-recruiter license, someone with a just a, a LinkedIn user could pay to put jobs there. This is certainly not 100% of the jobs that you'll be able to find somewhere on the internet. Just know that the source of these, of these jobs that are listed in the jobs tab come from someone who has paid either a credit because of their license uh, or because they've paid actual money to do this. But one of the other mysterious parts I mentioned before that lots of people probably don't know what content is. And again, think about your home, home feed. Today, I was looking and I saw someone that used to be at Choate years ago has announced, hey, we're adding to our team here. That showed up in the stream of conversations in my home feed. It may or may not also be listed over in the jobs tab, but you can actually search in, of course, this is a ha hangover to, from having the, the Sharon slide, but if you search on content, you can put in there either hashtag hiring. If you just search just for an experiment, we're hiring, you can add that Boolean search, we're hiring and counsel. See what comes up. It is not the neatest, cleanest, laser focused way of doing this, but it does help surface ongoing conversations that identify jobs that may never show up in the paid jobs tab. So that's, that's my commercial for looking up content. Um, whoops, I should have mentioned. So best practices for professional development and learning. And I'm talking about lifelong professional development and learning whether it's for your job or just something you're interested in or what you might want to expand into next hobby, retirement, you know, uh, weekend, weekend for, you know, distraction from what you're looking at every day in the office. Um, LinkedIn groups are a great way to find out more information and to share information. Um, you can join a LinkedIn group based on pretty much anything. There is a Red Sox Nation LinkedIn group, and there is the Boston Banking and Financial Services LinkedIn group and everything in between. North Shore Professionals. Um, it, lots of, lots of good ways to tap into people with like interests or like experience. Uh, you can send, uh, unless the, a fellow group member has turned this feature off, you can send a free message to fellow group members that are not first degree related to you. And that's, a, that's one really wonderful way to um, take advantage of having that group membership in common. You can hide or show groups in your page. And when might you think of this? I mentioned uh, Red Sox Nation before. If you want your professional profile on LinkedIn to be you in your work, but you still wanna take advantage of seeing things that come in through the LinkedIn group for Red Sox Nation, you can put it there. If you want to be part of a group, for instance, I had a client a few years ago who he was part of a group, um, adults with, and then insert a diagnosis. So he wanted to tap into that information for advocacy, for uh, uh, good practices and structure around how to take care of what that diagnosis is. Uh, but that is not something that he wanted the rest of the world to see that he was a member of because the assumption is based on the rest of his profile the assumption was it was his diagnosis so we want to leave that alone um, and contributing your brand as an expert if you're going to put a post out there and you're going to provide an update and it is super relevant to career counseling but not to everyone else maybe it's only relevant to my career counseling consortium northeast people um, if it's potentially for everyone. If it's all job seekers, I could put it into a group and identify things that uh, Keystone Partners, LinkedIn members who are usually current clients or former clients, what are they looking at as, as helpful? And then you can build awareness across industries, find potential employees, and then Im impress hiring managers and recruiters. Lots of recruiters, by the way, uh, they will join a group 
that uh, is a niche for where they hire out of and they'll wait and they'll see who supplies meaty conversation, kicks off an article, shares content that they think that the rest of the group will be interested in. Um, but even if you do not plan to go anywhere, you're not active in, uh, in these groups because you want to be somewhere other than you are. You wanna be a subject matter expert that's known for what you are, a thought leader. Excellent way to get started, especially in a group of people that will have the level of sophistication to understand what your contribution is. So your content, which is in the home feed, so you can actually customize that with a bit more uh, specificity and you can add to it. In your home feed, you'll see that uh, other than, you won't see this in any of the boxes that show what people in your network say or you know, give a thumbs up to. In all of the other things, like in here where I follow Inc. Magazine, the three dots, check out what you can see when you click on that more. So the three dots are what, what else is there? in the vast majority of those entrances, you will see the option to quote unquote, improve my feed, which will take you to what is actually in my book, not a very well organized jumble of, here we've got a company, so you can follow Sanofi. You can follow a career consultant, Christy Bonner, Brene Brown, and then you see here this hashtag pet care. You can follow pet care. Um, it's just a matter of getting, uh, basically they curate the editor somewhere behind the scenes at LinkedIn is curating content. If it's about pet care, it's going into this hashtag and everyone who subscribes to it will see it in their feed. Publishers, uh, companies, schools, it's, they're all types of ways that you can train LinkedIn to say, show me more of that and give that to me in my feed. You can also get to the discover more uh, section on the far left of your home feed. Uh, under the groups that you belong to, click discover more and it will take you to the same page. Now here are some additional resources. Uh, there's an official, uh, two official LinkedIn sites. So one is the Help Center, which actually does a nice job if you put natural language in answering questions. Um, or there is an official LinkedIn blog. Uh, that is where I learned a bit more as soon as all of the splashy dramatic shift happened two weeks ago for the content. The official LinkedIn blog provided a bit of information about what the changes were and what, what else would be coming, but it's still a matter of day by day, the experience that you have on LinkedIn yesterday might not be the same as today, and then it might return tomorrow. So we have to roll with LinkedIn. It's a little bit cranky sometimes, um, but they are always experimenting. Uh, the the Andy Foote gentleman I mentioned, Linked Insights, you'll see this under the independent source, Linked Insights is his website and it is very informative. He's got a, a, a Facebook group also uh, that has a little bit more, you know, that he does a lot of cross posting. So I think if you're in one, you might see another, but you can follow him to learn much more about link, uh, LinkedIn if you're at all interested. So it's, it is a very helpful way to, to get someone who's pouring themselves into trying to figure out LinkedIn from the outside looking in. And he does a wonderful job along with the people that he's uh, partners with. So here we have a little bit of time at least for some Q&A. Let me go to the chat. Um, okay, so here's uh, a question. So I didn't understand your point about network size. So if we think about what our reach is on LinkedIn, let's say I'm on LinkedIn, but I have zero connections. And I actually had a client who, as of two weeks ago, she had a, a profile, but zero connections. So whatever her activity is on LinkedIn, no one sees it. It's all inbound. If she has now 100 connections, all 100 of those connections, very likely, and I can almost bet you, every one of them has at least one connection. So now, in addition to having 100 first degree connections, so that she's seeing what they say, they're seeing what she says, she can now see another ring of another 100 people that might be able to share information. Um, so the more people that we can find and be found by, means we have a much broader reach when we put things out to the world and grabbing more information about what people are saying external to that. I hope, I, I hope that made sense. Um, another question, do you recommend that all persons within two or so hours of major city use greater XX area as location instead of a specific city? For example, if you have Portland, Maine listed, um, but wondering if I should go to Greater Boston. That really depends. I would think about where your target is to be there. There are some people that will think, you know, so-and-so, they're not going to drive down from Portland every day. Um, so it really does make a difference. If you put yourself in the human being's shoes that's going to be looking at your profile, 
Um, and if they're creating, when you think about the volume of people that could be right for a job, sometimes the more difficult position that recruiting folks are in, or even a hiring manager who's not a recruiting folk, but has their own opinion of how far they would drive for a job, uh, that makes a difference to people. So I would think about what your target is. Where do you want to be? Where do you want to be noticed? And you could use that. Let's see. Okay, so another, another question. What do you recommend about dates, especially with respect to education, and how far back should you list experience? A lot of people say hard and fast rule, anything beyond 15 years ago, don't put, it, don't put on LinkedIn. Certainly education, because you can put education in without a date. Work experience, you cannot put in without adding the span of years that you were there. So frequently when, when people are thinking, and we understand certainly there's ageism out there, uh, people will frequently call it at no farther back in the, new, in the work experience than 15 or maybe 20 years if you're at the same place and want to show something. But you, you would probably want to leave the educational dates off so that no one could do the math. People make assumptions about that. It looks like there might be a question and answer window that maybe I'm just not seeing up front, but I don't see it popping out. I'm sorry, if anyone put something in the Q&A box um, and I haven't already answered your question, if you wouldn't mind just putting it in the chat, I just don't want to miss it. Let's see. Any other questions? Well, let me just at least advance the slide of one more with contact information. Um, I'd be more than happy to, to answer questions, certainly. Um, LinkedIn is, it's mysterious to a lot of people. And sometimes even when you know it as well as we know it and what we do, it can still seem a little bit mysterious. Oh, okay, how do you search for people in groups? Oh, this, this is one of those love-hate things with the people in groups. In the old days, and I don't even mean two weeks ago, I mean several years ago, you could tell LinkedIn that you wanted to do an, uh, an uh, advanced search and you could put all of you, you could do your Boolean words, you can say must be in Boston with a keyword of X and please only search the population of people that I share group membership with. And they took that feature away. And I remember the day that I was looking, I was trying to find something about, you know, maybe someone who might have experience with fidelity. And I remember typing in fidelity and no one showed up in this particular group, which was just impossible. And then I searched by a first name and many people showed up. And then I searched by a last name and people showed up. So unfortunately, LinkedIn has really taken the teeth out of the advanced search. If you're trying to search just groups, you can walk through person by person. I mean, I belong to groups that even for work have 7,000 people in them. So that's just useless. <laughs> no one wants to go through step by step. It's almost as if you have to stumble across them. In the highlights page, if you share group membership with someone, when you're looking at their profile in the highlights page, it should tell you not only who you have in common if they're second degree, but if you're in a group with them and you're, you don't have connections in common. So I wish I had more to that. And I have spent uh, lots of characters trying to write uh, to LinkedIn, but they're not listening. So I wish I could give you more than that. It's limited to first name, last name. Once you're in the group membership list, you can search by first name, last name. Uh, or when you do an average search across the board, when you look at someone's profile page, it will tell you that you have that group in common. All right, so finally, another question. Can you talk about pros and cons of private mode profile viewing of LinkedIn Premium? So I search in private mode all the time, and it's only because of what I do. I don't want anyone to wonder, why is someone who spends a lot of her time coaching people who have just been told their job is ending, why is she looking at my profile page? So I don't wanna scare anyone. I would recommend that we search in completely open mode. I think it's an excellent thing to be leaving digital breadcrumbs around so that I have clients who tell me frequently, I looked at them and then I noticed that they looked at me. This happened this week, it happened to someone. I looked at their profile and then I noticed she looked at my profile. So it's, you know, maybe there's a conversation to be had there. Um, but I would recommend that people look in open mode. Um, one thing that bridges the question about private mode and LinkedIn premium. So I have LinkedIn premium, which is the only reason because I search in private having premium is the only thing that gives me a line of sight into who's looked at my page because it LinkedIn withholds that information from me. If I'm not a paying premium member, um, usually people who get premium, they usually uh, like whether it's the 30 day free trial or uh, they actually pay for it after that's over. Sorry to hold this over, but um, usually the things that people really like about premium are that they can write to anyone. 
And you know, you've got a certain number of, of in-mails that you can send, even if you're not connected to someone or a fellow group member. They like it because they get a little bit more of the analytics maybe when they're looking at jobs uh, and how they compare to other applicants, which take that with a grain of salt as well. Um, there are lots of other things to be thinking about rather than making sure that you are keeping up with other applicants. Uh, I've been told, for instance, that in a cluster of, I want to say about 900 applicants for a job in operations and robotics company. This is today, I was looking at it with a client, um, that I was in the top 10% of the 900 applicants. I had none of the top 10 skills that other applicants had, uh, but I did have an advanced degree. And so all of a sudden, for some reason, my profile stood out as being qualified to do that. And I am not. So same thing. I don't want anyone to be discouraged from applying if they see a lot of, of people heading uh, applying ahead of them. I would just try it. So I, that, I hope that answered the question. I know we're over and it's 6.02, but Sharon, any, anything that you want to add or? No, I think this has been great. Thank you very much. Um, and like we said, we, the slides will be distributed afterwards. Yep. Um, and I really appreciate everybody showing up and I look forward to seeing you all, if not in person, at least virtually without my technical issues. <laughs> Thanks so much, Sharon. It was a pleasure to present.